Welcome back to another video from PM Problems, the site dedicated to project management, construction management, and workplace topics. If you love that stuff too, be sure to check out our website at solvepmproblems.com for tons of free articles, downloads, and more. Now, let's get into today's topic. Construction managers split their time between two worlds, the office and the job site. As such, Construction managers must understand the ins and outs of both environments to achieve maximum success in managing their project. While many managerial tasks and skills in construction can be learned in the classroom, others require that we gain real-world, first-hand experience. In order to truly understand what happens on a construction site and how our projects actually get built, we need to spend some quality time in the field with our boots on the ground, observing job site operations in real time and learning from those who have more experience than we do. Before we do that, though, we must understand one crucial aspect about construction. Job sites can be extremely dangerous, and all sorts of hazards are ever present at every site you may step foot on. In the US alone, nearly 1,000 workplace deaths occur each year in the construction industry. That's equal to multiple construction related deaths each and every day. Additionally, thousands of injuries occur every year too, many of which can be life altering and career ending. It goes without saying that these injuries and deaths are tragic. On an optimistic note, most injuries can be avoided by understanding the hazards that are present on site, along with the precautions that should be taken before any work or even supervision takes place. While some job sites are more dangerous than others, it behooves construction managers to understand the many types of hazards that they'll come across at some point in their career, along with how they can be approached with safety in mind. Construction managers must also understand which preventative steps have to be taken ahead of time to mitigate the risks these safety hazards present. In this video, Let's go through 12 essential job site safety topics that all construction managers must know and why they're so important to understand. In order to stay safe on a job site, our first line of defense involves protecting our own body. We protect ourselves by wearing specific types of personal protective equipment or PPE. PPE is designed to protect vital parts of our body from harm and to keep us easily visible. There are all kinds of PPE that can be worn or utilized to keep us safe from specific hazards, but there are several types of basic PPE that should be worn anytime we're on a job site, regardless of the type of work that's going on. These PPE items include hard hats, safety glasses, high visibility vests or shirts, safety footwear such as work boots, and long pants made from durable materials. While not always required for construction managers, a pair of work gloves may also be necessary. These basic forms of PPE greatly reduce our chances of getting seriously injured while on site and in extreme cases may even save our lives. While an injury may seem unlikely, we should always expect the unexpected. As we continue through our list of job site safety hazards, you'll learn more about why PPE is so important, along with more types of PPE that help us stay safe from specific hazards. PPE is supplied to us by employers in many cases. In fact, employers may be required to provide certain types of PPE to each employee that steps foot on site by law. That said, if you're interested in checking out some of the PPE items we've discussed here, I put some links in the description below. Site safety planning can be broken into two parts, planning ahead to reduce the risk of accidents and being prepared to handle accidents should they happen. When it comes to planning ahead, all job sites should feature a written site safety plan. A typical site safety plan consists of the following information the names and contact info of competent persons on site, typically the site superintendent and foreman, safety requirements for the site, like required PPE and prerequisite training and certifications, we'll get to that next, a list of hazards related to the work taking place, a list of hazardous materials that'll be used, along with the safety data sheets for each and a plan to handle them, the addresses of the nearest hospital and outpatient clinic, depending on the severity of an injury, and lastly, the job site hours and address. This written safety plan should be accessible in the site's field office where it can be reviewed at any time. Each person who steps foot on site for the first time should review this plan and if performing physical labor, sign it too. As for being prepared for potential injuries and accidents, there should also be a protocol in place for either transporting the injured person to the closest clinic or calling your local emergency number. At least a portion of workers on site should be trained in CPR and basic first aid, if not everybody. With that in mind, it's a good idea to keep a quality first aid kit on site as well. Many companies, organizations, and local jurisdictions require that their workers and managers gain specific certifications before they can even step foot on site, much less perform work or use certain tools and equipment. Here are some of the most common certifications held by construction managers. An OSHA 10-hour or 30-hour safety training card, which covers a broad range of general safety topics. CPR certifications, 
scaffold user certifications, and certifications to operate basic equipment such as man lifts. There are certifications and training required for specific types of work too. This list only encompasses general certifications and training that construction managers are likely to need. Before we get to the next item on our list, I'd like to give a shout out to an organization we're affiliated with, and that's 360 Training. If you need to get an OSHA 10 or OSHA 30 hour training card and would like to do it online, I cannot recommend 360 Training enough. I personally got my OSHA 30 training online with 360 Training a few years ago and I highly recommend them. 360 Training offers an easy to use training experience that breaks down your program into manageable, timed sections that you can pause and resume at your convenience. 360 Training offers 6 months of access to their program so you can complete the training on your schedule. If you need flexibility and affordability while getting an OSHA 10 hour or 30 hour training card, click the link in the description below to learn more, and I promise you will not be disappointed. When it comes to construction related fatalities, falls are the leading number one cause. It should be no surprise that for any work taking place at height, at least one form of fall protection should always be in place. The term working at heights can encompass many different types of projects, such as the construction of a tall building, a bridge, or utility tower. However, OSHA requires that at least one form of fall protection must be in place where a drop of 6 feet or greater is present. With this in mind, let's discuss some examples of fall protection you'll come across as a construction manager. The most common type of fall protection is a full body harness. Harnesses must be connected to an appropriate tie-off point via a lanyard and clamp to ensure that workers won't fall more than a few feet before the lanyard activates and suspends them mid-air until they can be rescued. It's worth noting that two lanyards should be worn as often as possible, so a worker can remain tied off with one lanyard as they detach the other and move around the work area. Another commonly used form of fall protection is the guardrail. Railings installed along the leading edge of a drop-off significantly reduce the likelihood of a fall, so long as they're built to regulation, not climbed on or used inappropriately. Wherever work is taking place, railings should ideally include tow boards along the surface level to prevent things like tools, fasteners, or other objects from rolling off. A third form of fall protection that's commonly found on job sites is personal safety netting. Personal safety netting is installed along the edge or just below an area that personnel will be working. As you can imagine, these netting systems are engineered to catch a person in the event of a fall. While personal safety netting shouldn't be used as a primary means of fall protection, they serve well as a secondary form of protection on site. One more form of fall protection that's worth mentioning doesn't protect a worker from falling, but rather protects others who may pass below them. This form of protection is known as a tool tether. A tool tether is a strap that can be attached to both a worker and their tool while working at height. Should their tools fall, the tether will keep it from falling all the way to the ground and potentially striking somebody below them. Many forms of construction require large excavations and working at subgrade levels. Foundations for houses and buildings, substructures of bridges, and utilities beneath the roadway are just a few examples. Each of these project types have at least one thing in common the potential for a trench collapse to take place. Whether it be caused by the type of soil on site, an improper means of protection, a large unexpected vibration, or something else, a trench collapse can certainly be fatal. Soil is extremely heavy. In a deep enough excavation, a collapse can completely bury those working in the trench. Even trenches and excavations that are shallower than the height of those working inside them can compress a worker's body during a collapse, which can restrict breathing and potentially be fatal. This is why many governing agencies require some form of trench protection for any excavation deeper than 4 feet. To prevent collapse from taking place or to minimize their impact, there are several means of protection that can be used. Firstly, excavations can be dug at a specific slope or in steps to reduce the impact that a partial collapse would have. While the specific type of sloping or stepping that a project requires will depend on soil conditions, these excavation profiles remove the potential of a total collapse from the equation. Another form of trench protection is known as a trench box. A trench box is a prefabricated structure, usually made of steel, that is placed via crane or heavy machinery into a trench after it's dug, but prior to workers entering the trench. Trench boxes are engineered to withstand the force that a collapse would cause, so workers inside the trench remain safe while working subgrade. Trench boxes are common in roadway excavations or other job sites where space is limited. A third form of trench protection is known as timber shoring. Timber shoring is similar to a trench box in theory, but instead of using a prefabricated trench box, timber shoring is built by hand as the excavation is dug, often consisting of 3x10 timber lumber. These shoring systems can be custom built to suit whatever conditions are present on site. Timber shoring protection is commonly used while working in basements or below foundations for underpinning or other subgrade repairs. Regardless of the trench protection method that's used, each method should be designed and stamped by a professional engineer prior to the project starting. 
Wherever electricity is being used, the potential for electrocution is present. Construction sites are no exception. Not only is electricity required to perform work, but many construction sites sit adjacent to, on top of, or beneath existing live power lines. Structural materials and components that are made of steel can conduct electricity while power is being used or if struck by lightning. In short, there are numerous hazards on any job site that have the potential to cause an electrocution. With that in mind, there are many ways that individuals can protect themselves as well as ways we can work to avoid these hazards completely. First off, all power outlets or power sources should be properly guarded and rated for the amount of power being drawn from the power source. Ideally, a GFCI, or ground fault circuit interrupter, should be put in place so as to cut off power the moment a ground fault takes place. This ensures that a tool or device plugged into the outlet won't get overloaded and potentially shock the user. All extension cords should be in good working condition with no tears or breakage present and should be kept out of standing water. If you're working inside completed buildings, such as a residential construction project, and you're not sure if a wire is live, it's essential that a voltage test is performed before work starts. Voltage testing tools can detect live wires through outlets or even inside wall cavities to remove the risk of accidentally coming into contact with one while working. Protections can then be put into place or power can be shut off accordingly. While working near existing power lines or overhead power sources like a train or subway line, it's absolutely essential that all workers in machinery stay a set distance away from any live wires unless they've specifically been shut down to facilitate the work taking place. Overhead power lines should also be marked with bright tape such as neon orange to make lines as visible as possible to those working on site, especially to equipment operators. Any personnel working near live power sources can use specific tools and PPE to stay safe, such as shock-resistant gloves or pliers and wrenches that are designed to be insulated from potential shocks. Last but not least, personnel on site should wear shock-resistant footwear at all times. Overhead protection is exactly what it sounds like. A means of protection that's installed above head level to prevent falling objects from striking those on site. Falling objects can include building materials being installed, debris, and tools or equipment being used above. The most common type of overhead protection that you're likely to come across on a construction site is known as a sidewalk canopy, also known as a sidewalk bridge or sidewalk shed. A sidewalk canopy is a decking system that's built above sidewalks to protect the public from any falling objects. Sidewalk canopies are common on construction sites in urban areas and are also put into place when portions of the building or structure are at risk of falling due to existing damage. Another form of overhead protection is known as shielding. Commonly used beneath bridges that span over roadways or walkways, shielding will prevent debris from falling during demolition or repairs and will also guard against pieces of damaged structure that are at risk of falling. Debris netting or suspended decking may also be used. A third form of overhead protection is planking that's installed on top of designated walkways within the site itself. This typically consists of wood decking installed atop scaffold frames that are specifically rated for this purpose. This allows personnel to safely pass through the site inside work areas without the risk of getting struck by falling objects. So far, we've talked extensively about safe work practices. While many safe work practices are essential, the ways we access work areas should also be set up with safety in mind. Anywhere that work is taking place, safe access to the work is required. That said, what safe access looks like can vary widely based on project type and job site location. Work on roadways, for instance, requires that traffic control systems like cones, barrels, signs, flashing lights, and traffic attenuators be put in place to alert drivers of the work happening and guide moving vehicles away from work areas. Concrete barriers, aka jersey barriers, may also be used depending on the job site. Inside designated construction sites, OSHA and other local jurisdictions have certain requirements when it comes to staircases, scaffolding, ladders, ramps, and work platforms. Not just any set of stairs, platform, or other form of access will work. They must be built in accordance with safety codes using proper materials and components. Means of access may even need to be designed by a professional engineer and permitted by your local building authority before put to use. Contrary to popular belief, Ladders should only be used to access work on site, not to perform work. Work should not be performed off of a ladder due to the high risk of workers falling or the ladder tipping over when in use. While not a hard and fast rule, ladders should ideally be an A-frame type for their increased stability. Many types of construction involve airborne debris, particles, and vapors that are hazardous when inhaled or in contact with the body. Demolition of concrete, for instance, creates a lot of dust that contains silica and other contaminants. 
Removing hazardous materials like asbestos or lead paint creates fine dust that absolutely should not be inhaled, or even in contact with our skin, for any reason. Even certain chemicals such as industrial paints and other liquid construction materials have dire consequences if inhaled or within contact with the eyes or skin. Each of these forms of construction involves protecting the eyes, mouths, lungs, and skin of anyone on site while work is taking place. These types of work require that personnel on site wear some form of mask, like a partial or full face respirator with appropriate filters. Personnel must also wear eye protection, specific gloves for handling these materials, and potentially protective clothing such as coveralls to prevent direct contact with the skin. Work should also take place within an appropriate containment area so as not to allow any debris or vapors from leaving the vicinity and affecting the public or other unprotected individuals nearby. According to OSHA, a confined space is defined by three key metrics. One, an area that's not necessarily designed for people, but is large enough for workers to enter and perform certain jobs. Two, a space that has limited or restricted means for entry and exit. And three, an area that is not designed for continuous occupancy. Some examples of confined spaces in construction include, but are not limited to, manholes, tanks, storage containers, tunnels, ducts, pipelines, and equipment housings. OSHA uses the term permit-required confined space to describe a confined space with at least one of the following characteristics. A space that contains, or has the potential to contain, a hazardous atmosphere, or contains material that has the potential to engulf an entrant, or has walls that converge inward or floors that slope downward and taper into a smaller area which could trap or asphyxiate an entrant, or contains any other recognized safety or health hazard such as unguarded machinery, exposed live wires, or heat stress. Having defined these parameters, the first step towards working safely in confined spaces is to identify them before any work takes place. Once a confined space is identified, it's crucial to determine which safety precautions must be taken in order to mitigate the risks that are present. These steps can include providing additional ventilation or oxygen, blocking off hazardous areas, avoiding creating sparks or excess heat that could ignite flammable particles in the atmosphere, testing the atmosphere for hazardous airborne particles, wearing proper PPE, and implementing some of the other safety measures we've covered already. Many construction means and methods generate loud noises. These noises can be created by tools like jackhammers and drills, or large pieces of equipment, or methodologies like blasting. Loud noises can also be created by sources adjacent to the job site, like trains, factory equipment, or airplanes. OSHA requires that employers provide their employees with a means of hearing protection when workers are exposed to a decibel level of 85 or more across an 8-hour period. Hearing protection equipment includes earmuffs that cover the entire ear, as well as disposable plugs that are inserted inside the ear each day. While OSHA does define when ear protection is required, you may wish to use some at lower levels depending on your sensitivity, existing site conditions, or your individual preferences. The last construction safety hazard we'll cover is known as a caught-between hazard. Caught-between hazards come in many forms, but in essence, they occur when a worker is pinned or crushed in some fashion. Caught-between accidents occur when a worker gets caught in moving parts of a machine, as well as getting caught between a piece of equipment and a fixed object. Technically, trench collapses are considered caught-between accidents too, although we've covered those earlier. In order to protect ourselves from caught-between hazards on site, the following methods should be practiced. Areas where heavy machinery is in use should be blocked off with fencing or concrete barricades. Heavy machinery, including trucks, should be equipped with backup alarms to alert those in the immediate area that the operator of the machine might not be able to see the person behind them. Workers and personnel on site should all be wearing some form of high visibility PPE so equipment operators can see them with ease. Moving parts of machinery should have a form of protection surrounding them, even if it's caution tape, to keep people well clear of the hazard and only those authorized to use the machine should be any closer. Lastly, but most importantly, all personnel on site must be aware of the surroundings and the hazards that are present at all times. Awareness and paying attention are part of our first line of defense. Although construction sites present numerous hazards that can be extremely dangerous, the job site can be a safe environment when we take the time to protect ourselves, implement safety precautions, receive proper training, and keep ourselves aware of the dangers that surround us. Most of us have pursued a career in construction management because we find it fascinating. Construction is exciting and spending time on site should be a rewarding experience for all people involved. So long as we put safety first, we can remain focused on the work. I hope you found this list of 12 essential job site safety topics useful and informative. If you need an OSHA 10 or 30 hour card and want to get it online, be sure to check out the link in the description below.
As a reminder, I've also placed links in the description below for many of the PPE and safety devices that we've discussed in this video in case you're interested in checking them out. Thanks for watching and stay safe out there.